Hi, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. My guest today is author and researcher Alex DeWall. Alex is the executive director of the World Peace Foundation at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. We discuss several of Alex's books here today, including AIDS and Power, The Real Politics of the Horn of Africa, and Mass Starvation, The History and Future of Famine. Alex has also written on the political lessons of previous pandemics as well as previous public health emergencies in Africa. He's here today to discuss how governments in the region are reacting to the crisis and what further crises may lie ahead. A quick disclaimer, I've had the pleasure of collaborating with Alex on other projects and we've co-authored papers on South Sudan. Alex, thanks for coming on the podcast. It's a pleasure. So you've written a lot on how epidemics affect political power, uh, most specifically in the case of AIDS. Um, How might this uh, disease change power in the region as both governments and people respond to the havoc uh, wrought by this pandemic? And, And what should we be looking out for? I think we need to distinguish three impacts. One is the impact of the disease itself, that is the um, morbidity and mortality, the sickness and death. The second is the impact of the measures to control it. And then third is the impact of the secondary uh, effects of the epidemic, particularly on on, on the economy. Now, um, going back 20 years, there was a lot of fear and alarmism that the HIV AIDS pandemic in particular, but combined with other epidemic diseases such as tuberculosis, would cause widespread collapse of African states and armed conflict. That actually didn't happen. And in retrospect, the expectation that large numbers of people dying would cause a crisis in governance or uh, political challenges to governments was really unfolded, uh, unfounded. And um, governance systems are, on the whole, um, well placed to, well structured to to absorb the impacts of people being sick and, and dying. And the COVID-19 epidemic does not threaten the types of mortality, the levels of mortality that we saw with HIV and AIDS, or indeed with Ebola. So I would not be expecting state collapse because of uh, illness and death as such. Impacts that will come out of the uh, government responses are likely to be more significant. And here what we've seen is most African governments more or less following the Chinese, European, US model of uh, imposing isolation and lockdown measures. They did that partly, I think, because they didn't know what else to do and there was a, a sort of an international stampede to do that and an expectation that in order to be internationally credible, a government needed to do that. But then it soon became apparent that lockdown measures would be very unpopular and might be ineffective and would have huge secondary impacts in terms of uh, loss of jobs, loss of economic activity, especially in in, in the informal sector. Uh, and, And I think it is the possible inapplicability or mismanagement of these measures that will have the uh, quite significant uh, uh, political ramifications. Partly, I think, because African governments have not worked out the rationale for lockdown. The lockdown um, can only be a temporary measure. In the case of China, it was implemented with the intention of reducing transmission rates uh, to near zero so that uh, testing and case monitoring could then be in place for containing future outbreaks. That isn't going to be feasible in Africa. The infrastructure isn't there. In the case of Europe and uh, North America, it's been implemented with the aim of buying time so that the capacity of health systems can be brought up 
to the level needed to cope with the level of morbidity caused by the infection, including during the relaxation phase when the lockdown is is relaxed. And if we consider that most African countries simply don't have that capacity, I mean, in in Uganda, for example, there are only um, 30 something intensive care unit beds in the entire country. That's you know 1.3 per million. That is, it's not going to be possible to scale up. Um, the third rationale for for a uh, a lockdown is so that when you relax, you can actually have protective measures in place in order to ensure that those who are most vulnerable to future infection can be protected. So in this case, it would be the elderly, uh, those with uh, underlying conditions and those with compromised um, immune systems. And in the case of Africa, the elderly are relatively few, but obviously they, they are there. Um, and we have a major issues with um, HIV and tuberculosis. So the like uh, exit strategy would be um, associated with uh, those sorts of protection measures. And, but I'm not sure that we have seen the development of strategies for that kind of, of protection yet. And here there, there are some very encouraging uh, recent experiences, particularly with Ebola, of communities figuring out among themselves how to do that type of, 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 of protection. Our communities can think like epidemiologists. The transmission uh, dynamics of a disease like COVID are not difficult to, to understand, and African populations have a lot of experience of dealing with infectious diseases and are much more literate on this than, than our um, Western countries. So if epidemiologists and health planners can consult with communities, can begin to think like communities, then there are, are possibilities of doing this. Um, up to now, we haven't seen much of that. Can you explain more about how that would work in practice? Because, uh, of course, a lot of African governments, like governments everywhere, are, of course, under, you know, they feel under an extreme time pressure to move very quickly, especially given the lag that is there between the, the virus entering and then the ability to actually uh, test and uh, detect it. Um, so, so how would it work to set up an alternative to these sort of total lockdowns that some places are instituting? Well, COVID-19 is a complex emergency. It's not just an epidemic. Um, first of all, it's an epidemic that unfolds differently in different communities. It will play out very differently in a middle class suburb where people can isolate themselves in, in, in their houses behind their um, behind their walls um, to a, a packed peri-urban settlement, to a refugee camp, to a, a village, to a nomadic community, etc. And understanding the 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 physical uh, demography of different uh, settlement locations the different profiles of people who 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 are vulnerable is essential and no planner can have that degree of granular knowledge only a community can have that time spent in consultation and assessment figuring out what's going on in this situation that time is never wasted it's always worth spending a few days consulting with community leaders to figure out the 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 dynamics of how a crisis is unfolding and will unfold in that uh, community which can be done with remote technology as to you know what would be the workable solution for a particular community would be an enormously useful investment of this time. The the other point here, of course, is that um, police forces are absolutely at the centre of this. And there's remarkably little understanding about uh, policing in a pandemic. Um, police forces, of course, they suffer illness and death. They have to have their own mechanisms for protecting their, their members. But they also are at the forefront of interacting with the most vulnerable members of society, the people who are most at risk, and, and the communities or income categories who, who are also at, at most at risk. And developing policing guidelines is, is absolutely critical for uh, global cooperation and, and, and joint learning in over a very short period of time. Um, just quickly on that, I'm wondering what you think of the counter argument 
that precisely because Africa's so unprepared for this pandemic from a public health perspective, that the best approach would be to try to lock down as much as you can in hopes that the global capacity that's being created um, in order to fight this disease elsewhere, that those peaks might pass elsewhere, and then the global community will be able to, uh, to, to come to the assistance of Africa, and that the best thing Africa could do right now is, uh, is buy time, essentially. I think for that to work, two things would need to be in prospect. One is that it would need to be a lockdown of you know 18 months to two years, which I don't think is feasible. And secondly, we would need to have an international community that is interested in responding. And it's quite astonishing how, in comparison to 20 years ago, when we had um, Kofi Annan at the United Nations, when we had massive collaboration over um, response to international health threats, and even the, the, the George Bush presidency, although its foreign policies were much criticised, one of the things that the Bush administration did was to take a lead in international health diplomacy for the United States. It became the biggest funder uh, by some margin of, of, of international health. That has entirely been squandered. And the decision uh, recklessly taken for purely domestic reasons by President Trump to um, attack the WHO, terminate funding and personally uh, impugn the credibility of its director general, who is, of course, an African, has has been really shocking to 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 many African countries. The idea that the U.S., that which they had considered their friend and ally on international public health issues, uh, some a country to turn to for assistance in health crises. Most recently, of course, in the case of Ebola, very um, with mixed results, but nonetheless a lot of real. Uh, expressions of solidarity and leadership from um, from the U.S. The fact that the U.S. would turn its back on on Africa in this way um, is, is is quite shocking and, and 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 disturbing. Now, African countries, like you know, all countries around the world, uh, mostly right now, are facing you know quite a double whammy. You know, on the economic front, both what looks like a global economic depression, and then their domestic economies, you know, are more or less uh, collapsing at the same time, depending on on what sort of uh, measures they put in place. Have we ever seen a crisis quite like this in the region? I think this is unprecedented because of precisely that combination of, of uh, the international economic environment and the domestic measures. So, Clearly, there's almost nothing that Africa can do about the the, the looming, imminent global recession. Um, no one really knows uh, how deep it's going to be, how long it's going to last. But the, you know, the collapse in Africa's export markets, the crash in the oil price, which of course will bring some relief to those oil um, importers, but to countries like Nigeria, Angola, South Sudan is is is, is calamitous in terms of the, the revenue loss. So the, the, the international environment is extremely unfavorable and we've had these types of international economic uh, downturns before which have, have, have been very bad for Africa. But what is different this time is it's combined with the social distancing lockdown policies that are that are being implemented which directly impact the livelihoods of ordinary people in the informal sector directly impact the um, food supply chains and supply chains of other essentials at the local level and also um, everything we know about economic adversity and food crisis and how people respond to these stresses, points to the fact that people rely on their social networks. They call on their relatives, on their neighbourhoods. Um, they move around um, to, um, to find uh, casual work uh, elsewhere. And uh, lockdown uh, policies directly uh, impede and, and negatively impact those types of coping strategies. And I think African governments, clearly they are getting their act together in terms of 
organising to appeal for uh, debt relief or suspension of, of, of payments on, on, on debts, for uh, international assistance and so on. And, and, and that might be able to blunt some of the external uh, economic adversities that are afflicting the continent. But they need to think a lot more creatively about how to keep these informal economies uh, functional. Otherwise, um, we're going to see a lot of food insecurity, a lot of hunger, and of course, associated with that, um, a sharp increase in the disease burden of diseases other than COVID. In your book, The the Real Politics of the Horn of Africa, one of the things you do is you link a lot of previous political upheaval in the Horn of Africa region to external economic shocks, um, oftentimes. And I'm wondering what it is about political power in this region, specifically, and how political power works that you think makes it so susceptible to these economic uh, ups and downs. I think we can distinguish two different types of, of, of shock. One are the major uh, economic uh, insults that bring the the basic parameters of state functioning to the point of collapse. And in my book, uh, The Real Politics, what I do is, is I say that during the 80s and the early 90s, the, the, the fundamental economic factors that allowed states to function were pushed to the point where states could no longer function. The revenue basis for sustaining basic state state functions simply wasn't there. And that included security. It included paying for um, professional, well-organized, uh, unitary militaries. Along with that, the expectation that it would be possible to return in a short period of time to some form of governmental normality, that also evaporated. So the, the, the modern emergent state bureaucratized, rational bureaucratic state structures that were emerging in much of Africa in the 1970s into the, into the 1980s were, were really destroyed. And what emerged out of that was a much more transactional politics of personal and regime survival in which leaders used the resources they could get their hands on and used the uh, measures such as the licensing of pillage, basically t- saying to their army officers, their militia commanders, I can't pay you, but if you go out and steal, if you go out and loot and pillage as part of your counterinsurgency, I won't ask any questions. Um, so you can pay yourself that way. So these are the sorts of structures uh, that emerged out of that uh, major crisis. And that um, system, which I call the political marketplace, has proved very resilient as a as a system as such, very resilient to to the ups and downs of the uh, the global economy, but also very sensitive to certain sorts of of uh, economic change, so that a country that has been very reliant on oil revenues for its leadership to translate that oil money into patronage payments, examples being um, Sudan and, and, and South Sudan, or Nigeria for that matter. Um, when the, that oil uh, revenue dries up, they go into crisis. So as we see um, commodity markets uh, shrivel up and, 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 oil, and oil income evaporate, we can expect these kinds of disturbances within the uh, political system. So it would it, it would endanger regimes that are uh, reliant on these sorts of, of income. I don't think it would cause a structural change in the way that uh, money is traded for political loyalty. In fact, it may even see an intensification of that. Now, if we look at the Horn of Africa and the two biggest countries there, Sudan and Ethiopia. Both of those countries are attempting democratic transitions at the moment. So they are both attempting to place their political systems on a, on a different basis. Um, uh, Sudan trying to break out of the uh, crony capitalist uh, mercantile war economy political market that has been in place for the last 40 years or so. Now, 
already before the the shock of COVID nineteen, um, the the uh, civilian led government led by Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok was already struggling, and the number one reason why it was struggling was that it hadn't had any sort of financial or economic bailout to speak of. Um, Hamdok took his position in August of last year on the assumption, on the implicit promise that there would be uh, a suspension of sanctions, debt relief and rescheduling and new economic assistance coming in, which would not only stabilise the Sudanese economy, but also empower him and his technocratic government vis-à-vis the patronage-based, uh, militarised uh, political system of the, the generals and particularly the paramilitaries under Hemeti. Now, there has been no assistance um, to speak of. The internationals have, have um, let down Sudan, um, and particularly the United States. And, and so already, even before uh, the COVID-19 struck, the, uh, the transition in Sudan was under very, very serious uh, economic stress. And I fear that um, what's happening now will just intensify that stress. In the case of Ethiopia, it's slightly different because Ethiopia was not run on a, the basis of a political marketplace. It was actually a under the the late Prime Minister Mela Zenawi, Zenawi. It was actually trying to develop a very deliberately a developmental state that was the opposite of an alternative to a, a, a rentier political marketplace. That was already unravelling under his um, successor, Haile Mariam, and under Prime Minister Abiy uh, Ahmed, the the economic and political, political liberalisation has left Ethiopia in this um, rather unstable uh, hybrid between having a, a, a the the political economic momentum that it had of the developmental state before and an emerging uh, trade in political loyalties as as the economy is privatized and key power brokers from outside notably the the united arab emirates and the us move in to um, to challenge the uh, the old system I suspect the the economic crisis um, will intensify that uh, commodification of, of of political loyalties, but it's um, really much too early to say uh, what is going to happen there. Yeah, and of course, the political transitions in Sudan and Ethiopia are major concerns of ours as well as we look at how this pandemic is going to affect things. Um, I'm wondering... When you scan around the region and look at how governments have responded, they haven't really responded uniformly. You've had some governments, you know, I mean, Uganda comes to mind, institute, you know, quite harsh lockdowns. And then you have Ethiopia, which which hasn't really gone that far. And Sudan has sort of waffled and is is now instituting or is planning to institute a uh, quite a quite a strong lockdown. Have we learned anything about the governments in this region and their relationships with the people and how they've responded so far, do you think? The most predictable case, of course, has been Rwanda. And Rwanda um, is probably the one country in Africa that can follow a Chinese-style model of, of, of a very well-organized, administered and very well-policed lockdown. And it's doing that. Um, Uganda is interesting because... Um, Museveni back in the 1980s gained a huge amount of credibility and and learning from a response, an early and efficient uh, homegrown response to the HIV AIDS epidemic, recognizing um, that the country needed to pioneer its own response from the grassroots. And uh, Museveni gained a lot of political capital from that in the 80s and 90s, and he's drawing on that. And so his, his is, is, is an interesting amalgam of, of, a, uh, of a lockdown along with uh, social welfare measures. Um, Tanzania is taking much more the, 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 the sort of the, the, the populist angle of saying that we will have faith in God and, and, and dismissing the fears. Ethiopia, ha- there's been quite an interesting debate within Ethiopia. 
And uh, here I think we see some, some of the legacies of the community-based approach to public health that emerged uh, during the EPRDF regime. That again, that hasn't been forgotten. It, it's, it's important, it's very interesting to reflect on why Tedros Adhanom got his job. And the number one reason why he got his job was that the Ethiopian model of public health uh, during the EPRDF, including his five years as, as, as Minister of Health, was spectacularly successful in rolling out basic health care, preventative health care, health care education, and improving the, the basic indicators of maternal mortality, uh, child mortality, life expectancy, um, malaria in particular. V amazing progress on that. And and with all the attacks on, on Tedros and, and all the evident shortcomings of the World Health Organization, the enormous progress that Ethiopia made, which catapulted him to that position, should not be overlooked. And that was a, an amalgam of community-based health care with, with biomedicine. And some of, of Tedros's... Um, uh, colleagues in that government, notably his Prime Minister Haile Mariam Desalegn, came out of that tradition. They are um, they, they are technocrats with a, as it were, a community development bent, and they have been quite um, effective in putting together a package for Ethiopia that combines elements of that community mobilisation with. Uh, community consultation and, and, and how to contain it. They've not been very good at communicating that. The messages coming out have been very, very mixed. But I think the Ethiopian response may turn out to be um, actually better adapted than uh, the moment it's being given credit for. Uh, Sudan, the, the, there is a contestation here. Uh, the uh, Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok uh, is highly literate in this. When he was at the UN Economic Commission for Africa, he was uh, involved in the Commission on HIV AIDS and Governance in Africa. He 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 was involved in 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 studying the the social, economic, and governance implications of epidemic disease and understands the issues very well. However, he's not necessarily calling the shots for the military. The opportunity of uh, having the the legal and security tools of a state of emergency for controlling the, the population uh, that is too good an opportunity to turn down so there are the the motivation behind the uh, the, the the more securitized militarized response in in in, in Sudan reflects the ongoing unresolved power struggle between the civilian and, and the military. And I'm afraid at the moment it's leaning in favor of the military. Now, one final question uh, while we have you, uh, which is something else that you've written a lot on is uh, the the world's you know increased capacity at battling famines and almost bringing famines to an end. I'm just wondering as you you know, look around in this current context if you worry about whether or not the World Food Program and the rest of the, the infrastructure that's there to really battle hunger will be able to respond effectively um, if, if, you know, these, if the pandemic uh, and its aftershocks does spiral into a humanitarian crisis uh, in, in several places at once and in this current uh, global political context. I think that is probably the single biggest fear that the African continent and especially Northeast Africa needs to worry about now because we are seeing each of the key elements in um, the, the, the drivers of, of famine and response to famine being adversely affected. So food supply chains are being seriously disrupted, which is going to, it already is leading to uh, food price increases. The real demand for purchasing food by vulnerable people, especially you know, poor people, is going down because of unemployment, because of restrictions on economic activities. So already, you know, very, very many poor people, well, just, you know, one, 
or two days income away from being plunged into starvation. And I think we are beginning to see that already on, 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 on quite a significant scale. Uh, the uh, ability of governments to respond is compromised. The ability of the international system to respond is compromised by uh, restrictions on travel, by the uh, restrictions on, on, on shipping, by all the other pressures on, on, on budgets. And the number one cause of mortality during the food crises is, isn't starvation as such, it is infectious diseases. And one of the, the fears is that uh, lack of food combined with increased uh, morbidity because of, of COVID uh, infection could lead to a, a, a complex health crisis whereby we will see um, a sharp increase in mortality uh, associated with, the, uh, with COVID, but most of those who would be suffering and dying would be from causes which are malnutrition and, and, and other diseases. I think this is a very serious threat that needs to be taken into account as a matter of urgency. All right. On that somber note, Alex, thank you for this fascinating discussion. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time to come on to our podcast. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. This marks the end for now of our special COVID-19 series. We will be back to regular programming with our next episode out in two weeks. Once again, The Horn is a production of the International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell, and this episode was produced by Mae Francis. 